when it comes to a, a new birth within a family, uh, it's good that we have the opportunity usually to make preparations uh, for that birth. Occasionally, you, you do hear uh, about women uh, who have been pregnant and haven't realised. Uh, I used to be a bit cynical about that until I had a friend uh, who, uh, for various medical reasons, uh, she and her husband had been told that uh, uh, they were never likely to, to have a child. Um, she was also that bit overweight. And so uh, she found that she was putting on weight. And so uh, went to her doctor to see what could be done about it. And uh, he said that she was something like six or seven months pregnant. <laughs> and she didn't know. So she didn't have very long, really, uh, to prepare for uh, the birth of her son. Uh, perhaps for some of you, I am taking you back away in time. Others may uh, have uh, had a child come into your family just recently. Uh, part of my own preparations were uh, going into mother care in Aberdeen and uh, ordering uh, uh, things uh, from a cot to nappy pins uh, to be shipped across to Lerwick in the Shetland Islands, which is where we lived at the time. It also involved ordering a maternity uniform from Hong Kong. I tried to order one from uh, the Salvation Army's Trade Department in this country, and the number of months it would take them to uh, provide one, uh, I thought it would be safer to go via Hong Kong, and they supplied very quickly, and still do, I believe. <laughs> When it came to the birth of our second child, uh, we were living in Singapore. And uh, our uh, uh, preparations there for a sister's delivery uh, in a Roman Catholic hospital. So the sister's delivery was a sister's delivery on two counts. She, she was uh, uh, a nursing sister, but also a nun. Uh, the preparations there uh, involved getting the money together for the birth because no national health service there. Uh, if we had wanted the services of a gynaecologist, that would have been extra. Well, it's good that we do have these months of preparation, isn't it? During the season of Advent, we remember God's preparations for the coming into the world of his son. Very different from any we might make. It's such a familiar story. So many of us have heard it since we were tiny. Um, the birth of John the Baptist, the angel appearing to Mary, the birth in Bethlehem, the unexpected visitors, the shepherds and the wise men, all this still enacted. Uh, some of you may have the pleasure of seeing this uh, being enacted at one of our uh, local schools. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing uh, um, our, our grandchildren uh, uh, involved in this. And uh, locally, I believe we are to have a travelling uh, nativity. <laughs> uh, some of you uh, involved in Open the Book. The preparations, however, didn't take just months or years, but centuries as God, through his people, through his prophets and others, writing, they tried to prepare his people for the coming of the Christ child, the Messiah. It's truly amazing to see the links between the Old and New Testament, shown particularly in the Psalms and the book of the prophet Isaiah. Micah tells us that Bethlehem was to be the place of the Messiah's birth. Isaiah forecasts that he will be born of a virgin. Zechariah forecasts that he will ride in Jer Jerusalem on a donkey. Well, this can be described as a deliberate act on Jesus' part, 
but we cannot personally engineer the place and manner of our own birth. To take just one of the prophecies, for example, Psalm 2 and verse 7, uh, which links the Messiah as the Son of God. The cynic might say, oh, this is just coincidence. But taken as a whole, the evidence becomes very compelling, particularly as Christ Jesus links himself to some of the prophecies. In Luke chapter 24, we have it recorded that after the resurrection, two of Jesus' disciples were walking to Emmaus, very dejected because they felt that all their hopes had been dashed. And then a stranger comes alongside them, or at least so it seemed, for they did not recognize him. And Jesus gets into conversation with them, and he says to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Wow, wouldn't it have been great to have been able to eavesdrop on that conversation? In Luke chapter 4, Jesus returns uh, to the town of Nazareth and reads part of the messianic prophecy from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And rolling up the scroll, he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I can imagine something of the reaction of those who were gathered there. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Uh, what's he doing? Um, applying, or at least seeming to apply, these words to himself. I guess Jesus sensed their uh, discomfort. Uh, and uh, basically he says to them, a prophet is not uh, without honour uh, except amongst his own people. And we read that all the people in the synagogue were furious. They got up, drove him out of town. Uh, and uh, there were those who were intent on killing him. Why the outrage? Well, it seemed that Jesus was setting himself up as God's anointed one. When John the Baptist is in prison, uh, we read that he asks for confirmation that Jesus is indeed the anointed one. And Jesus, he quotes the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Uh, saying that uh, uh, the blind can see, uh, that uh, uh, the deaf can hear, that the, the, the dead uh, are raised. He points to the, the signs of the coming of the Messiah. So one could go on. If we were to uh, try and connect all the uh, prophecies, uh, with what we see in the New Testament, we could be here an awfully long time. <laughs> John chapter 8 and verse 58 reads, Before Abraham was born, I am. 
this was said uh, in, in part of a, a, a conversation that uh, uh, Jesus uh, had uh, uh, basically saying that uh, uh, he was there before Abraham was. What was that all about? For some of his hearers, this was blasphemy. Here was somebody uh, claiming uh, to be equal with the divine. And they picked up stones to stone him. The shock of what Jesus said and what he did, um, we maybe lost something of it today, uh, but uh, this was not lost on his first hearers. It seems that many saw the coming of the Messiah as heralding a kind of uh, golden age. Uh, as I was thinking about this, uh, I couldn't help but think about uh, Brexit, uh, whichever <laughs> way it falls, other those expecting some kind of a golden age um, as a result of uh, uh, what's about to happen politically. It will be a time of peace and plenty, of justice and righteousness. The fortunes of Israel will be restored as the nation looked to the Jewish nation, as the people looked to the Jewish nation for guidance. By the time we come to first century Palestine, Jesus is born into a country under Roman rule where a dominant popular hope for the Messiah was for a king like David with a role of political liberation and conquest. They wanted a king to save them. It's interesting that during that period uh, we had things like the Roman peace. It was an uneasy peace enforced by an iron hand, but it was a peace. There were the Roman roads. Greek was uh, part of the lingua franca of its day, I suppose a bit like uh, uh, English these days. These things were to further the spread of the, the gospel. It's interesting, isn't it? The things that God chooses and the people God uses and often the unexpected. Well, we know that Jesus was a very different type of saviour from what so many have been hoping for. Here was one who would bring release from the tyranny of sin and self. One who by his death and resurrection brings the promise of eternal life, life in all its fullness. In Jesus, we have indeed Emmanuel, which means God with us. The, our expectations have been far superseded by the reality of God coming to earth in his Son and ministering to our deepest needs. What I wonder are we expecting this Christmas? Amongst all the presents and Christmas activities and celebrations, could it be that for us, God is wanting to do far more than we imagined or expected? In our Christian journey, there is always more to learn, more to experience of what it means to follow Jesus Christ and center our lives in him. For me, this is summed up in a hymn by Philip Paul Bliss. The first verse says, Have you on the law believed? Still, there's more to follow. Of his grace have you received? Still, there's more to follow. More and more, more and more, always more to follow. Oh, his matchless, boundless love, still there's more to follow. 
well, may we indeed find that uh, this is true this Christmas, that there is always more to follow and to uh, experience and grasp more and more of the tremendous love that God had in coming into the world and not just the world. We sang earlier in our service, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. May it be for each one of us, not just a general thing, Jesus coming into the world, but Jesus coming a saviour for me and for you. May we indeed experience it in a personal way. And so that transformation that uh, uh, Jesus came into the world can be there in our lives.